disorders. Um, she has studied many different therapeutic approaches and combines her knowledge to best fit the unique needs of the children that she serves. Um, Sophia strongly believes that each child has strengths and interests that can be identified and built upon to allow them to reach their highest level of potential within their active participation um, in their daily life. Sophia is joining us here today. Thank you so much for being here. I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. Thanks, Lily. Um... Hi everyone. <laughs> so as Lily gave that wonderful introduction, I am a clinician. So um, I hope I have some information that you guys will like. I'm not gonna be as technical as the last speaker because <laughs> I don't have that kind of knowledge. But <laughs> um, as she mentioned, I'm a, a pediatric physical therapist and I have a private practice clinic. Um, and I work primarily with uh, children with cerebral palsy. Uh, before I start, I just kind of want to let you all know you can just jump in anytime and, and ask questions or kind of have like a back and forth discussion going here. Um, so, all right, so I guess, what I wanna uh, talk to you guys about, you know, Lily told me I have about 20 minutes to chat and I was thinking, well, what could I talk about in 20 minutes that I hope would be impactful um, to future clinicians or people who are um, just kind of interested in learning more about how we work with this population and uh, reflecting on my own practice and my successes with working with children with cerebral palsy. I feel that um, the most impactful thing for me has been um, like looking, approaching these children from their areas of strength rather than looking at them from a place of deficit. So I feel like as clinicians, we're trained, you know, we, we look, we learn all about body systems and environments, and we learn how to assess our patients and look at like what the areas of limitation are, and that's really important. But I think that in order to get success and buy-in from our patients, specifically when they're children, that we need to be approaching them from their strengths and kind of building upon their strengths rather than uh, focusing so much on their deficits. So having said that, um, what does that look like, you know, in a clinical setting, and and why why build on the strengths, right? So I guess I, I'll I'll address first the why. You know, I believe that my role as a physical therapist is um, first and foremost just to like enhance the the functional independence of every child that I come in contact with, and I do this um, through my interactions with them and their caregivers. When we're working with a pediatric population, we have to take into account the caregivers as well as the patients, because um, oftentimes um, our patients are very dependent on their caregivers. Uh, so this means that we have to get to know our patients. We have to like just take those few moments, whether it's at the beginning of every session or, it's um, during the evaluation to just let that child explore and, and um, have the opportunity to just kind of sit and watch them and interact with them without any expectations so that we can really get to know like, what is this child's strengths? What are the interests? What, you know, what are the things that we can use to motivate them? Um, in order for us to see functional gains, we need to, to be making, to be targeting neuroplastic changes when we're working with these kids. And for that to happen, the child has to be actively participating in the session. And um, so from all my, from my understanding of how to kind of harness that power of neuroplasticity when we're working with children with special needs is that activities need to be self-directed, they need to be rewarding and they need to be functional. Um, so while we look at children and, and we look at our patients and we kind of, you know, as clinicians looking at like, okay, these are the areas that we need to work on and build upon. These are the areas of limitations. 
what we need to be doing when we working with them is kind of going like, you know, here's what you have. So a lot of the children that I work with have very little functional strengths um, that we could just kind of look at and go like, oh yeah, look, you can run or you can walk. These kids, many of them don't even have head or trunk control yet. So sometimes we feel like a little bit challenged there and going like, what are the strengths of this kid? And if you go into seeing these kids with an open mind and just kind of letting them explore in whatever way they can and then kind of helping them, you can see that everyone has strengths. So the strength of a child might just be their ability to cry, to let you know that they're not you know, comfortable or they can smile at you. And, and those are strengths that you can build upon. Um, so. <laughs> As we're looking at the, as, at the child's strengths and building upon those strengths, we also have to look at the caregivers and talk to them and get to know them and get to understand what their day-to-day -day, uh, life looks like and, what, and how they are including the child in those day-to-day -day lives. So um, the children I work with, often kids with cerebral palsy and that have complex needs the first few years of their lives are very, very um, medically involved is what I, so, you know, they, they're starting off a lot of times, they're in the, the neonatal intensive care unit for a long time, or for a period of time, they're having a whole bunch of procedures. Um, just a lot of things are happening to them in those first few years of life before things start to settle down. People are trying to figure out, you know, what, what's actually going on, what's the cause of all of this. And, and what ends up happening is you have um, children who are just used to having things done to them and caregivers who are used to uh, just kind of uh, in a crisis mode all the time, just kind of caring for a child who they see as a sick child. And I feel like as a therapist, my role is to come in and, and kind of help them see their child as a child and um, that they can interact with in a way that's not necessarily clinical or medical, you know, like the job, when, when, I, when I talk about increasing function, the first functional task of a child is to play. And I think sometimes we kind of forget that as clinicians and we were wanting to work on things that might be important to us as adults. But for children, play is really, really important. And we know that play is a, a driving force for building your cognition, your movements and you know just all your areas of development your social interactions and all of that so if we have caregivers that are so focused upon just you know giving meds giving feeds feedings you know all the things that go into having to take care of of your child and nobody's there to help give them the tools to to learn how to play with that child because Playing with a child with complex needs looks very different than playing with a child who is typical. Um, then we are kind of robbing that, I don't want to say robbing, we're depriving that child of an opportunity for growth in a different way. So as a therapist for uh, children with special needs, I have to be really, really creative about finding ways for this child to play and ways for the caregivers to be able to interact with the child in a playful way and kind of see this therapy sessions as a way to just kind of step away from some of from a lot of the stressfulness of the the other medical things that are happening having said that while i'm doing that i still have to keep on the back of my mind all the things that i need to do to make sure that this child is gaining skills um, that are important developmentally. But also when we're working with children, um, we have to look at so many aspects that we're not necessarily having to take into account uh, with adults because children have um, skeletal systems that are still developing 
they all all their body systems are still developing and so we have to make sure that we're giving them the movement experiences the uh, communicative experiences you know the social experiences all of those things that are also going to help all these other aspects of their life to develop at the same time so it's just a little bit more complex <laughs> and um we have to just be really really creative as pediatric practitioners about how we can make all these things happen for these kids with complex needs. Hmm. All right, I've been talking a lot. Does anyone have questions so far? I have a question. So how do you promote, um, mm -hmm. I guess I look at it as the clinicians you're working with and the children, how do you promote those changes or that willingness mm -hmm. to grow I don't, I don't know what term to use but the willingness to want to or be, be able to have the child change in the way or the for clinician have their perspective change and be able to promote that creative play or that different play like um is it very different between people but between different children and different clinicians or is it kind of like similar recipes seem to work across the board or is it yeah, well, I, I would say individual, every, every person's an individual, every child is an individual, you know, so um, while there might be treatment techniques that we learn, what's really important as a clinician is that you have a toolbox of ideas or, or approaches that you have at the back of your mind that you can draw from in the moment. So what that looks like for me is I'm a very hands-on therapist because a lot of the kids I'm working with cannot generate movement on their own. So what I'm looking for with my hands on the, on the child is kind of like, you know, I'm talking to them constantly. I'm asking them like, hey, what do you want to do? What do you like? You know, and you feeling with your hands or you're watching their face, you have to be really, really um, have this ability to kind of focus on the child and, and take any cues that they give you because they cannot communicate with you. Um, they're not speaking or, you know, sometimes it's just something as subtle as like a little eye movement that goes towards, you know, a toy that they want or somewhere they want to go. And then you're like, oh, you want to go over there. And then you, I, I use my hands to, to kind of guide them so that they can participate in whatever way possible to move towards what they want, you know, and if that's not the way they wanted to go, they're not going to try. <laughs> they just going to stop and be like, mm -mm, that's not what I wanted. So it's, it's very, um, it's subtle, I guess, uh, but it's also very, I don't know, it's empowering for me as a clinician as well, because this has kind of been something that it's a skill that you kind of develop the more you work with the kids, um, this ability to get out of your own head and leave your expectations kind of on the side and just really, really focus on the moment and what the child is telling you through their body, through their, their movements, through their eye gaze. Um, and, and if you're lucky enough to have a child that can talk to you and tell you, then that, that makes it so much easier. <laughs> so uh, did that answer your question? Yeah, um, and it sounds like a very difficult job. Um, when the, once you get things moving, is there, you know, like, um, uh -huh. Imagine there's the developmental arcs once you can initiate the play, turning it into the other developmental milestones. Um, uh -huh. or is, is that the case or is it because they could have their own trajectories in that sense, too? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the goal I, I find a lot that, you know, and this is, brings up something I wanted to talk about because the child these children have been having so much stuff done to them and for them, they, they're not often like actively participating. And this develops something that's called learned helplessness. So I find that when I'm working with these kids, that's, that's the first thing that I have to work past with first the child so that I can show the family that look, your child has capabilities that are just a little bit different, you know, <laughs> um, and but that they can do for themselves, and and also empowering that child to to feel that in themselves that like 
I can do this, you know? And once you get that, I feel like that's, that's where we start to see more active participation, more empowerment. As, as the child starts to feel empowered, then the, the caregivers start to feel empowered as well. And that's where you start to see like really nice, bigger changes starting to happen. Okay, so um, any other questions? <laughs> I think there was another question in the chat. Um, the question was, can you give an example of a way that a caregiver can play with a child who has trouble moving their head slash trunk, maybe a game or something? Um, if you could just kind of give some examples of what that might look like. So moving their head, do they, can they control their head slash trunk? <laughs> like, can they, uh, so again, you know, it depends on the child, right? On what they're interested in. So what I would do with a child like that is like, and if I'm teaching a caregiver, I'm going to find, first of all, like the easiest way for the caregiver to interact with the child because it takes, it takes a lot for, for me to teach a caregiver how to use their hands in a subtle way. And it's different for every single child. And so I will teach caregivers that, but first I, I try to work with the kid and see what I can get the child to do actively and then show the caregivers how they can um, kind of get that, that activity happening for the child. So if there's a child who has very limited head control or trunk control, then probably the easiest place for a caregiver to play with them would be either on the floor in a fully supported position, or it could be um, in, a, in a wheelchair. And you know, if the child is not sitting appropriately in the wheelchair, not completely supported in a way that they can participate in a game, then you know, that's something you need to assess as well and make sure that we're like giving them the support that they need. Um, but what you would do is then come to that child, whether they're on the floor or in a, in a supported device or whatever you, you have to support them complete. So this is what I like to tell caregivers. If your child is working really, really hard just to hold their head up, they do not have the capacity at that point to then take their attention to the game or the activity that you're trying to work with them on. So if your goal is to increase head control, then you should have that in the back of your mind and, and then not layer on another expectation that then they're gonna reach out and play with this toy at the same time. If you're trying to work on playing with the toy or playing a game, then you wanna make sure that the child is completely supported so they're not having to work so hard on just holding their body up so that then you can help them interact with that toy and they can actively participate in that. That answer the question, you think? Okay. All right. So um, let's see. What, how am I doing on time, Lily? Am I good? I'm doing great. I think we have probably about another five ish minutes. If anyone okay. else had any questions or anything else that you wanted to share, um, you know me, I can talk for hours. <laughs> I like talking. So I would like to answer anyone's question at this point. Um, because it's hard for me to take something to talk about in five minutes. Um, I do I was, want to, oh, go I was, ahead. I was wondering if you have, so I don't have any um, clinical experience, but I've spoken with a lot of people with brain injuries and what you're describing kind of reminds me of, um, I guess one big difference is that they're not children, but when you lose something that used to be automatic in you, and then there's this like, self-judgment or you know this inability to start from scratch to rebuild it but what you're describing is that clear rebuilding it, it is possible I think it's possible in all of us it's kind of how our nervous system is built so I don't know if you have any experience with non-children and promoting that or how to get people to at least yeah want, want to try you know um, so I, I used to work with adults uh, post-stroke primarily mm -hmm. um, in my earlier career. <laughs> Um, and, you know, as we all know, you know, there's more and more research coming out that's really supporting that we can make changes, we can, we can build new pathways. And, you know, the things that we need to, to keep in mind is that people have to be actively participating. 
And people actively participate when they feel empowered. You know, if someone comes up to you and criticizes you about things all the time, <laughs> you're less likely to be an active participant, right? But if someone approaches you in a positive way and, and highlights your strengths and then just kind of empowers you slowly to, to try things that maybe are a little bit challenging, but you feel supported in that, you're more likely to be to actively participate in that. And that's the same thing that I see with kids. And that's the same way that I would approach an adult um, when I was working with adults. Now, I must say, I have not worked with adults in many years, um, but I do have some kids that are older that I work with. Um, the difference with adults is that they already, they have what you call muscle memory or they, they have a memory of how to do that activity. Kids don't have that. So it's a whole different challenge with kids because we're not rehabilitating kids, we're habilitating them. Right. We're teaching them from scratch something that they've never experienced before. So it's just a whole different process, I feel like. Um, but so it, it, in some ways, even though kids are more ripe for neuroplasticity, um, as far as their brains go, they don't have memories that they can draw from of how that activity is supposed to look or feel. And so in some ways it's kind of uh, like when I worked with adults post-stroke, they just progressed a lot quicker than kids do, <laughs> you know, just because, because they have, you know, also because they have an acute injury, whereas these children have an injury that's probably, you know, years and years old. Um, there's just all kinds of aspects that go into that. <laughs> so I, I wanted to highlight and thank you for your comment about um, not mm -hmm. layering when you're working on something. Because mm -hmm. I think for me personally, as an adult trying to access help, that's annihilating because yeah. they take the thing I'm working so hard to work around and hammer me with it and layer on to it because they don't see it it's invisible yeah so i uh hope that your point working with children can be broadcast far and wide to back to those who are working with adults i hope so too <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. and uh yeah any, any other questions yeah, I also just wanted to share, I was looking at the clock wrong. We do, we do have about 10 more minutes if anyone else had um, any more questions. I did have a question. I was kind of curious, um, what would you say the role of, you were talking a little bit earlier about kind of independence and this learned helplessness. What would you say the role in um, building, what is your role in building autonomy for children um, and independence? Okay, so I guess, that is my whole goal, right, <laughs> for, for children. So um, for anyone that we work with, really, that I feel like as, as clinicians, that should always be our goal to get a level of independence. It is not always possible for someone to be completely independent. So I think that I just need to qualify then when we're talking about a level of independence, it doesn't mean complete independence, right? But it just means that I would like this child or this, this person that I'm working with to be able to participate in whatever way possible, whatever capacity that they have to participate in every activity that, that goes on in their day-to-day -day life. So, so that we have this idea of like things not happening to them, but that we're working with them. Does that make sense? So we, we're trying to, to just, just empower them so that it's kind of like, instead, you know, it might be something as simple as like, hey, I need you to roll over. And you're just gonna say, hey, can you help me roll over? You put your hands, you know, on those places that we've identified are the key spots that are going to help them figure out how to move their body. And if you just, if all they can do is turn their head that way, then you're like, oh, thank you for helping me. And you help them finish it, you know? Um, but you give them that chance 
to to initiate it or to participate in in whatever capacity that they have. Like so, yeah. So fantastic. Does anyone else have any questions? Anything that comes up? Anything? <laughs> Yeah, I agree, Nancy. I think it's important to talk about empowerment, especially when we're talking about children with disabilities. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and that's that's really speaking to that. I feel like that's really the key to my success with working with kids. Like, you know, I've had I've been doing this for a while now <laughs> and just worked with a lot of different kids. And while there's a lot to be said for different techniques and it's really important to understand how you're going to help the kids technically, the big piece comes into that empowerment piece because if, if the child is not empowered, if the caregiver is not empowered, then there's just, you're just gonna hit a wall a lot quicker than you, than you would if you gave them that empowerment. So it's, it's kind of my little, my little bandwagon right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, but oh, someone wrote something. Let's see. That is true, Ben. Good. <laughs> so, well, I guess if no one has any other questions, I really thank you guys for giving me a few moments to chat. And I hope that I had some helpful information. And um, yeah, you guys can always contact me if you need any information. Uh, I have, well, I, did you put my website up or anything like that? Really? Yeah, we'll definitely be able to kind of distribute um, all of our speakers contact information or more information about their work and what they're doing. Um, but yeah, thank you so, so much for joining us today, Sophia. Um, if anyone has any questions, we'll make sure to pass along your information so that we can continue this discussion. But for now, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. All right. <laughs>